Good evening, and thanks for joining tonight's TI Technology Webinar hosted by Texas Instruments. For tonight, we're going to talk about the SAT and how to get your students to think graphically. My name is Mike Houston, and I'm the moderator for this event. I teach algebra and calculus near Pittsburgh, where I use TI technology to make tough to teach, tough to learn concepts accessible to all my students. I'm really excited to be joined by our two panelists, Jeff McCullough and Tom Reardon. Jeff co-founded the TI Inspire Super User Group with Bryson Perry. He teaches Algebra II and AP Statistics at St. Mary's Episcopal School in Memphis, Tennessee. And in 2009, Jeff received the Presidential Award for Excellence in Mathematics and Science Teaching. Jeff authored the second edition of the TI Inspire for Dummies and the second edition of the TI-84 for Dummies books. Jeff, it's great to have you with us tonight. Hey, glad to be here as always. And Tom taught at Fitch High School in Austintown, Ohio for 35 years. Now Tom has served, uh, and Tom currently serves as an adjunct professor at Youngstown State University for the last 34 years. As a T-Cube national instructor, Tom has worked on the development of the TI Smart View emulator software, TI Inspire CX, and TI Inspire Navigator products. Tom currently works for TI and product strategy and development. He also does professional development nationally and internationally. Tom, we're excited to have you with us tonight. Hi, everybody. We're expecting a large crowd, so your audio is muted. Feel free to send any questions to Jeff or Tom using the Q&A window on the right side of your screen. We'll also be using the chat window tonight to send general messages. As a reminder, this session is being recorded, and we'll provide a link to the event certificate of attendance I'm sorry, I was linked to the event certificate, uh, yeah, certificate of attendance at the conclusion of tonight's webinar. We hope you don't have any audio issues tonight, but in the event that you do, try selecting communicate from the very top of the WebEx menu and choose audio broadcast. At this point, Tom is going to discuss our agenda. All right, so first we'll have a welcome and introductions, which we're doing right now. Uh, look at recent changes to the SAT. Uh, we're going to use both platforms, the 84 and the Inspire, to solve SAT problems. That's pretty much what we're doing tonight uh, in, in the process where we'll incorporate strategies for success on the SAT. And uh, at the end, we have a webinar drawing. Thanks so much, Tom. And Jeff is going to discuss our expected outcomes. So one of our goals uh, here in outcomes, we want to discuss both platforms. So. If you're a TI-84 user, we're going to discuss how to use that effectively. You might even learn a few things. Same thing for TI-Inspire as we address these different SAT questions. Um, we want to talk to you about strategies that you can use in your classroom to help students solve these difficult problems um, in multiple ways. And also just familiarize yourself with some of the more recent kinds of test questions they're asking. Uh, you may be surprised, uh, as we were, um, on, on some of these kinds of questions that they're asking in recent tests, SAT tests. Thanks so much, Jeff. Tom, you should have control. Feel free to share your screen. Okay. Um, so here we go. Um, so first of all, the um, website that will have materials from tonight, we'll point this out again later. Uh, this is uh, bit.ly, bit.ly forward slash SAT 2020TI. That is um, case sensitive. There's nothing there right now, but materials will be there by tomorrow at noon. Jeff and I have to put them together tonight <laughs> after we're finished. So uh, right. don't go, go there, but it's just it's blank. Okay. Now, as an added bonus, all day today I've been working on, and yesterday, Super Bowl fun facts and activities. So this is another website here that you might find interesting. This is a bonus. You know, whatever. These are the things that are there. Hope this uh, fun facts. And it's both for the 84 and the Inspire. Uh, feel free, pass that along, do whatever you want to do with that. So with that, let me go ahead and jump to uh, first problem here. So um, Jeff and I have been working on this for seems like forever, three or four years, and uh, <laughs> yeah. came up with um, some problems, some recent problems. And we're not allowed to use actual SAT problems, so we have to kind of like rewrite them. And so um, 
When it says NC, it's no calculator, C is a calculator. So the first one is this one, a no calculator question. Uh, which of the ordered pairs listed below is a solution to the system of inequalities above? And um, I'm hoping that my students, uh, by using graphing technology, would be able to just go ahead and graph this, just draw a pair of axes and, and graph those two inequalities, shade appropriately, and then decide which ordered pairs there. So uh, use, I'm hoping they think graphically. That's one of the phrases we came up with several years ago, and to visualize graphically. Uh, we teach algebraically, but we need to think and, and teach graphically as well. So if I was on an Inspire, I could go ahead and graph y equals greater than or equal to. 2x, okay, and then I'm, and since I'm in relation mode, I can graph y is greater than or equal to negative 2x, and where they're purple or maroon or whatever you want to call it, that's the intersection point. So our question was which ordered pair, and it turns out to be that one, the one zero two. So which is and how do you how do you graph a relation, Tom? Can you remind me again? Sure. Uh huh. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, pull up and inspire. Just happen to have a graph screen there. And um, I'm going to go to menu, this is on Inspire, and view, I'm sorry, graph entry edit. And one of them is relation. So it's menu, graph entry edit, relation. And so now you can okay. write type in anything in terms of X and Y. So I'll just do one of them here since you saw how it went. So Y, and I can put the inequality sign uh, greater than or equal to, uh, let's say, negative 2X. And then I, then, so, oh, wow. so, so I was going to do another one later, but I'm glad you asked. You asked. Um, so that was that was the first one. Pretty, pretty straightforward, but still for some students could be could be tough. Okay. Um, the second one again, no calculator. It says what is an equation of the graph shown? And again, on this, it seems like they're not showing enough, but they are showing enough, I guess. But this is what they showed on the on the actual test. Um, and I'm hoping that students, when they'll think about this graphically, they say this is an exponential decay, so the base yeah. has to be between zero and one. Um, and hopefully that would rule out A and B right away. Um, but what I'm thinking is a lot of students, unfortunately, will see this negative one right here, and that one uh -huh. think that's right there, and they're going to jump on it, and or, or either the, either one of these two actually, they get these mixed up. But um, it turns out that this one has, does have a horizontal asymptote at um, the, 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 the parent function does at y equals zero or the x-axis. So the one we're looking at actually just dro drops down um, to negative two. Wow. Horizontal asymptote negative two is the answer is D. Okay. Now an alternative way to do this would be to pick a point on the graph like negative one zero and say, all right, if I plug it into or substitute it into each equation, like the first one, 2 yeah. to the negative 1 power would be a half minus 2. Well, that's not 0. Second one's 2 to the negative 1 is a half minus 1 ain't, ain't going to be 0 either. C is not going to work, but D, 1 half to the negative 1, 2 minus 2 is 0. So that would be an alternative way to do that. So, Tom, what does the NC mean at the top? Someone asked a question about calculator or no calculator. What's the NC at the top yeah, of that NC question mean? It's just our abbreviation for no calculator. That's not really on the test. Usually it's a section of non-calculator than a section of calculator. So I also wanted to show people this um, using a slider on Inspire because I think this is important to see. So uh, let me go to another page here. And uh, I'm going to type in... Um, f of x is equal to uh, the quantity. I'm going to use control division to get the cute little fraction template on the Inspire and graph y equals one half uh, raised to the x. And then that's going to be plus some constant, I'll call it k. Now, on the, when I do this, when I type this, it automatically says, do you want a slider? And I'm, I'm all in. Sure, I'll take a slider. And so now I have a slider here. and. Uh, my preference, though, is I like to have the slider be in, in a minimized one. So I'm going to control menu on this and minimize the slider. And now I can just go ahead and, and have my students, uh, by pressing the right arrow, the uh, value for K, oh, I press escape, sorry. Press the right arrow, K will increase, and the left arrow, K will decrease. And I can go right, right to that. But with the latest version of the software, if I go back to tab and go to the equation, and do control menu, I can pick attributes so that 
Not does it just show the name of the parameter, but go show me the values. And so now when I do the, um, or when I change the values of K. Oh, that's really neat. And see it right in the equation. And before we oh. step transfer, you know, the K equals zero, K equals one or whatever. And so a lot of the things Jeff and I talk about aren't preparing students to help them use the calculator on the test. We're having the calculator be a teaching and learning tool and a discovery tool and a checking tool and, you know, visualizing tool, all these good things. Um, so taking the test, even though it says no calculator, we're using the calculator to help our students understand the concept. Yeah, because that's the question Leanne had. She said, I thought this was a no calculator question. But what you're, exactly. you're saying is you want to teach them the concepts of how the transformations move and so forth about, about exponential graphs here, for example. Right, and, and for example, like look at this here. Look at what, how many I can how many I can investigate in in 30 seconds when I in one I couldn't graph one by hand in 30 seconds. And probably not even correctly. Or maybe I could, but students could. <laughs> Hopefully, I could. Yeah. go that way. So um, so yes, we're looking at using the calculator as a teaching and learning tool. So that's where we went there. So that was uh, I could also do the same thing with the transformation app on the 84. And I will show that later in a different problem. I'm trying to show okay. the calculator. Okay. All right. uh, what I call number five, we're skipping around a little bit. Uh, it says which of the graphs could be described using this equation. Um, and if, in case it's hard to read, uh, the horizontal axis, each of these are one unit, and on the vertical, each are five units. So um, I love this problem because it has so much in it. And um, the first thing I'm hoping my students can say are, are what are the zeros? And so looking at the first factor, hopefully they'll see that x equals 1, the second one x equals negative 2, and the third one x equals negative 4. So when I look at A, it's in the running. I look at B, it's yeah. in the running. If I look at D, it's in the running. But look at C, if you mistakenly went with negative 1 for the intercept oh, and yeah. positive 2 and positive 4, you're like, this is great. I got it right away. It didn't take me very long. And unfortunately, you missed it. Okay. Now, the other thing is we got three, we still got to rule out some more, so now we have to start talking about multiplicity, and that's where uh, this comes into play where x plus 2 the quantity squared is, and that means it's either tangent at, at well, it's a tangent at negative 2, okay, which means it could like a bounce up or bounce down, some people say, so um, that's kind of kind of rule out D. D is, is only a, a cubic yeah. uh, with a single factor. So that's um, interesting that multiplicity can be on the SAT. That's a pretty intense, uh, yeah. you know, concept. Yeah. yeah, this isn't usually done in Algebra 2. This is more of a pre-calculus type concept. Sure. Um, so um, now I even have to go to end behavior because B and A are now in the running. And so end behavior mean like let's pick a number like, like 10. When X is 10, when I substitute here, I'm going to get like 1 minus 10 is negative 9. I'm going to get 12 squared. I'm going to get 14. So I'm going to get negative times positive times positive. This is going to be a negative number. So as x gets larger, y is getting larger but in the negative sense. So it's going to be a. It's definitely not going to be b. So b is ruled out and a is ruled in. Wow. So there's a lot of stuff going on here. And to me, if I have the calculator to help me teach that, I can have my students learn that much quicker. And in fact, they discover the patterns, not me tell them the pattern. So if you like give them problems like this and say, graph these on the calculator and discuss in your groups, what's the relationship between the zeros and the factors? So for like the first one, x minus two times the quantity x plus three. Two is a zero, negative three is a, a zero. Okay, but these are the factors. And then when you flip flop the signs, negative two, positive three. And then when you start talking about multiplicity, you can see that two is a factor, or two is a zero, but it's a multiplicity two, negative three of one. And then this is my favorite one, Jeff, I think you can anticipate. What are, what's, what's throwing kids on this one besides the multiplicity? That x equals so you, zero. They don't, they don't get that. Oh, just, yeah. Yeah. Just, they lose it. But all of That's those things point. Can, be, can be looked at. In fact, if we had more time, I would love to make uh, the exponent be a uh, slider and show you how it bounces back and forth between bouncing and going through as an intercept. And this could be done in yeah. the 84 as well. How are we doing? 
Okay. Doing good. Yeah. All right. So um, that takes us up to this one. And um, it says in this function above, C is a constant. If G of 3 equals 0, what's the value of G at 1? So look at all that's there. We've got uh, a parameter, a coefficient of X that's not uh, a number. Uh, we've got function notation. Um, so algebraically, doing this algebraically, I went straight forward. G at 3 equals 0, substituted 3 for X, did all the calculations. And I ended uh -huh. up being negative 5. And of course, you know what's going to happen. Kids are going to do what? Uh, and Jeff, fall for the halfway call? answer. What do you call that? You're going to fall for that halfway answer. Right, exactly. Okay. And this, ha and, and your students have to understand they're out to get you. The people who write these questions, they're out to get you. They want to find out you're, if you're reading the question or not. And so one of the things Jeff taught me was always have the kids read the question, not the entire problem, the question, answer the question. But we didn't find G at 1. What we can do is now put in negative 5 for C, evaluate G at 1, which isn't so bad, and we get negative uh -huh. 6. We were close, but not close enough. <laughs> but now this next one, I want to show graphically on this one as well, and, and I, I see what you think. See what you think here. So I'm going to go on the 84 okay. for this one, because I haven't I haven't done the 84 yet, so I think I don't want those people to feel left out. So uh, I'm going to go ahead and use the transformation app. So it's the last one in the applications, transformation. And uh, I'm going to put in zero. I'm going to store that in for my um, parameter, which was the letter B or C. Uh, let's see. Uh, C, yeah, C, oh, for alpha C. Yeah. Uh, C. yeah. All right. Um, and now, when I go to Y equals, you'll notice that Y1 and Y2 have special things, meaning I can do transformations with those. So I'm going to type in G of X there. So it's 2X squared plus alpha C. I'm going to put the times X in. Uh, I don't have to on this calculator, but on the Inspire, you would, because on Inspire, you can have variable names with more than one letter. Okay. And so when I graph this, I get this, and this is, with, this is really 2X squared minus three, because C is zero. Now, what I'm looking for, it says, I want to know when G at three is equal to zero. So right now, I'm going to start pressing the right arrow until I can get G at three equal to zero, but I'm not getting anywhere near three. So I oh, need yeah. to go the other direction. So stop me when I get it, G at three equals zero. I think right it's there, right there, maybe? Is that right. it? Right. Yeah. And notice that the value we got for C is negative five, which we did algebraically. I can now see it graphically, which I thought was kind of cool. And I might Wait, can you see the, that. you can see the answer now, can't you? Well, right now I can press trace and trace to one and get negative six. Or Wait, how did you trace to that. one so quickly? Can you show, so show us how you did trace. that? So I press trace and once you type, start to type a number, the calculator says, oh, you want X to be one, press enter and I'll take you there. So negative six was the correct answer for that one, okay? But it, it's just showing graphically how we did it algebraically. Okay? And I just thought so that was kind of cool. So one of our participants had a question about where did you get that transformation app again? Where did you find that? Under apps, there are a whole bunch of applications. Since it's the last one, instead of arrowing down, I arrow up, and there it is. It okay. really has, the reason it has funny names is because there's um, eight letters. You're only allowed to have up to eight letters. It's an old 8080 chip. And so you yeah. kind of like eight letters. So that, that's why we're stuck with things like ply smolt to inequal. <laughs> yeah. So again, this could have been done on the Inspire too uh, using a slider. I just chose to use the 84 this time. Okay. Um, how's the speed? Is anybody complaining about the speed? There's not too many complaints yet. Not too I many complaints. All right. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. So um, the next one says that what value of H does a function uh, reach a maximum value? And uh, again, I'm hoping my students would look at this and say it opens up downwards. It's a proud opening downwards. The, the vertex will be a maximum since it's opening downwards. And that the vertex is at the point negative 3, 5. I'm hoping that's like an automatic for them. But Unfortunately, it's not. That being said, I've got kids who are going to tell me the answer is five. 
Oh, yeah. It's really tempting. That's the maximum value. And there it is, maximum value. But it's saying at what value of X? So the correct answer is, of course, negative three. Now, one way I, I tried to get around that was my kids weren't, whenever we talked about maxims, they had to t had they tell me this that the maximum value is y equals five, and it occurs when x equals negative three. I wanted the whole thing. And so that when we got into calculus also, and they say, you know, the, the absolute minimum value is this, and it occurs when x equals that, so that they were very, they really understood what they were talking about. Yeah, especially that, you know, the, just the language you're using, absolute maximum, and, and you know, that's really good. So um, for this one here, um, I can show this on the Inspire, okay, um, and, and, but it would work on the 84 as well. I could just go ahead and graph the function and trace it. And while I'm tracing it, when you get to the maximum value, it puts a big sign out that says, hey, you're at a maximum. And there it is at negative 3, 5. So that, that's just a matter of using graph and trace on the Inspire. Uh, 84 would not tell you it's a maximum. You could uh, ask for a maximum or you could just see it that that's the vertex. Well, it's part of the calculate menu, right? If you hit second, trace, the calculate menu, then you choose, I think maximum is one of the choices. Gotcha. Yep. And then you do that left bound, right bound thing. Yep. Yeah. All right. I have two more, and I think time-wise I'm doing okay. Because so, this was a calculator question, right? Like this, you can yeah, actually graph this in the calculator. Really, yeah, which really surprised me, but I think, but look at all the, the answers. Look how easy some kids would say, oh, yeah. It's, it's five. Oh, no, you take the opposite. No, you take the opposite of this one. And then there's a yeah. negative here, and who knows what that's going to do. Uh, so the, the, the distractors are, uh, you know, very, very distracting. All right, so again, encourage your students to think graphically. Yeah, I was working with a group in Detroit on Saturday all day, and they were tired of he hearing me say that, but I think they got <laughs> the point. All right, so this one here. Um, Look at this problem. This is, again, the way that they ask questions on the ACP and SAP are very different from how we ask them. The concepts are there, but how they ask them. So it says, the graph of this parabola intersects a line and at these two points, we need, and it says, what's the slope of the line? I mean, there's a lot of stuff going on here, okay? Wow. So algebraically, as I usually do, I, I find Y when X is negative 1, so I find C. Do the same thing, Y, when X is 2, find D is 8. And so I've got ordered pairs and finding the slope, negative one, straightforward. But I find it really be nice if I could see this and, and on, on the calculator. And so yeah. Inspire is actually better for this one to see it. So I'm going to go back to Inspire here, uh, though it could be done on the 84. Um, so I'll go, go here and I want to graph um, y equals 12 minus x squared. And you'll notice I'm not seeing the whole thing. So I'm, instead of changing the window, one of the things some inspired people don't know is you just can just go and click on the, um, the value you want to change. Now change that to say 15. And now you know, I just changed my window. Okay. Oh, so yeah. That's neat. Look so, hot, but, you know. so now I've got that. And so there's also another new feature on Inspire I thought was kind of cool. If you're in a graph and you press the letter P, it says, you want to put a point either by coordinates or just put a point on the screen. So I'm just going to go ahead and put a point somewhere. I'm just going to do number one point. And I'm going to put a point somewhere on the, on the graph there and another one on the graph here. And then I'm going to press escape. Now first say, that, what's that going to do? Well, the two points were negative one comma something and two comma something. So what I can do is go to the X coordinate and I can change that point to be, I say, I want to know when that is at negative one, what happened? And there's that 11. And now I can go over here and say, I'm going to change that, that value to just plain old two, and that value is eight. So those are the ordered pairs that I had to find out algebraically, but I can see them graphically. And now what I can do is draw a line through those two points using the geometry tool. and then find the slope of that line. So through that point, through that point, and then with the geometry, I can use the measurement tool to find the slope and 
when I point to the line, there's that negative one. Same answer, just shows it graphically. So I don't think a student should do this on the calculator. I think this takes a lot too long, but I like the idea that the student can see it, visualize it, and double check their answers. Hey, Tom, do you mind showing my way of doing that? I just, I want them to see a different way of doing that Inspire. Yes, if you Tom. can un undo that just for a second, can you hit undo a few times so that so the points go away? Yeah. Yep, go ahead. So I might use trace. So if you okay. go menu five one trace, and then type in the value like negative one. Right. And press, like and then press, press enter to lay down the point. Gotcha. And, and then press two or whatever it was, I think, and then press enter and lay down the point. Right. So um, that's it's a, another way it's of a different it. way of doing that. And then uh, the, question, the question by a participant was, can you do this on 84? And, and the answer is um, no. Yeah. Um, I, I, you can trace to those points. Yeah, you could trace you to the points. And um, you actually could draw the line, but I don't know that you can find the slope of the line. You have to do draw the draw feature. So no, I would say no. Yeah. All right. So last one, last one that I'm going to be doing anyway, um, is one. that one. All right. So this is a system, and systems are really big on SAT inequalities, equations, linear, quadratic, whatever. Uh, and it says in this system, what is the value of x over two? And um, so I've got several ways to do this. And Jeff and I are really big fans of multiple representations, multiple ways of doing things. So just going to, and, and I'm, I have them in a certain order that I want to do them. So the first one I would call the most traditional. Uh, since we want to find X, we're going to eliminate Y. So I multiply the top equation by negative two, the bottom by two. And the reason I did the bottom by two is I didn't want to have a fraction. So that's the reason why I didn't just go from there. So when I do this, I get x equals 14, and look at what happens. Wrong answer, but the students will jump on it. So they have to remember to take half of that, and then that is the correct answer. So that's that's what I would call tradition. Um, a second sure. way would be to eliminate x, get y, and unfortunately, look what happens. That's there, and then students will say, oh, yeah, that's right, I <laughs> cut it in half. Well, yeah, I cut it in half, but it's still wrong. Um, you can then uh, yeah. solve for x, substitute y equals negative 5, and unfortunately get that and jump on it, do all this great work, and just, you know, finally get this. Okay, this is correct. Um, but this is where it gets a little, and also you could just solve for x over 2, too, in the, in the second equation. But this is where it gets kind of cool, so you can use matrices. And I'm not saying this should be done with matrices. I just think people need to be aware that it can be done because a lot of people have those calculators and don't realize it has that feature. So I'm going to use show the 84 first. And um, first of all, I better turn off that transformation app. Oh, yeah. You can tell because of that. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, so still have the equation. Um, so for, for this, if you have the newer, calcula newer uh, color calculator, alpha, Zoom is a quick way of setting up matrices. So you can get a two rows by three columns. And then once you've got it set up, just go down to OK. And you're ready to put the numbers in. And so for this one, uh, the coefficients are one. And you'll notice it says to press the right arrow, because if you press enter, it goes out of the matrix. So follow the directions on the screen. So zero, or I'm sorry, one, two, right arrow, four, and even if I press the right arrow here, it takes me to this. Huh. My coefficient is a half, so I'm going to go ahead and put in the fraction template to get the one over the two. Uh -oh, for some reason, like the zero there, so I better delete that zero. Um, then two y's, and then negative three. And so there's my matrix, and I'm going to use row reduce echelon form to solve it. Those are above x inverse, so second x inverse gives me the matrix keys go over to math, and I'm going to use the up arrow to get to the bottom quicker, and letter B, row reduced echelon form, on this matrix, you don't have to put in the right parentheses, but I kind of like to do that. And it turns out that X is 14 and Y is negative 5. Again, 
we have to cut the X in half and get X over two equals seven. But be aware that that can be done. The other thing I'm not sure many people know about on the 84, Jeff, is that there's a, that app that I was making fun of before, apply SMALT2, all yeah. the simultaneous equation solver two, as a simultaneous equation solver. And you can do two, two equations, two unknowns, up to a whopping 10 by 10 system, which is wow. we'll do it, okay? And you'll notice along the bottom, these things, commands go to the hotkeys along the top. So when I want to go to next, my key is actually graph. And then I put in the coefficients here. So uh, one, and notice I can even change the plus or minus, uh, which I think is kind of cool, but I don't need to here, two and four. And then I'm just going to This is much here. nicer than the old interface. If you have an older version of 84, the interface is not this nice. This is nicer. Yeah. And so now to solve, again, it's going to be the graph key. So I'll press the graph key, and there's, again, my solutions. Yeah. So that our Inspire friends aren't upset with me for skipping them out, um, I'm going to go ahead and add a uh, calculator page. And under menu and algebra, number seven is solve systems of equations, and the second one is solve systems of linear equations, which is what we're at. And, and this interface is really nice. It says, what do you want? Two equations, two variables? Just press sure, okay. And just type them as you see them. So x plus 2y uh, equals 4. And then arrow down, and, and I can use the control division to get that cute little fraction template. Oh, that's nice. Plus 2y uh, equals negative 3. And when I press enter, it's done. That's it. X is 14 and Y is negative five. Um, here again, I'm gonna do that the graphical solution to it. Uh, since they are written as the relations, I'm gonna go ahead and go back to menu and do that graph entry edit and do relation again so that I can just type them as I see them. Um, X plus two Y. I know I'm overdoing this problem, but I, I just want people to realize how many different ways these can be done, and then um, that's a game changer. You don't have to solve for y on Inspire, so that's not a thing on eighty four, right? Um, right. You'd have to you'd have to solve for y. Exactly right. I'm glad you pointed that out. You'd have to solve for y here in order for this to be. Um, now notice again, my window isn't right, so I'm just going to go over here to my x value here, and I'm going to say I need that to be like twenty. So let me go ahead and change that to 20. And now I can see the point of intersection better. And again, I could use the menu, um, analyze graph uh, intersection feature and say, start here, somewhere in between here. And as soon as I roll over it, it says there's your intersection point, 14, negative six. You could do this on the 84, but you would have to solve for Y in terms of that. And of course, I mean, even then, even if you do all that, you know, some students are not going to realize it's half of X, X divided by two. So the answer is seven, not 14. Exactly. Yeah, that halfway answer stuff. So we did all these things. I got to show you the last one. Okay. Uh, this the last one here is a, a non-traditional algebraic solution. So if you look at those equations, and some of you probably saw it right away, and I, and I hope you did. But if you just subtracted the equations as you saw them, you end up with x over 2 equals 7. We're done. That's it. And oh, this, wow. This solution is one that um, SAT loves. It's using something called algebraic structure. It's using the structure of algebra to have you do things uh, in a different way, uh, and you save all kinds of time. Wait, and so you just what? subtracted the two equations, and you got the answer in one step? Yeah, if you just look at it and say, oh, you know what, these will cancel out, and this is, you know, these will add up to zero, and this will be half X, I'm done. So it's just a matter of looking, you know, looking for a pattern or looking for something to make your life easier. And Tom, you know how I, like, wow. You, you, slight variation on this, your, your way is definitely better and faster than what I was thinking. I took that top equation, I solved it for 2Y, okay. and substituted it into the second equation for 2Y. Okay. Sure. And that wasn't too bad. I thought that was pretty easy, but then when I see your way, I'm like, oh, that's using structure even. That's, that's really good. 
Yeah. I like that. So anyway, uh, reminder to everybody uh, that that website on the top will be active tomorrow at noon and the other one on the Super Bowl if you're interested in that. And with that, I'll graciously hand this over to Jeff. Thank you for, for being so nice and letting me finish this up because I was kind of rushing, but thank you. So um, I need to go to a sign. And Jeff, you are now in control, I hope. All right. Okay, so here is um, another question here. Um, it's kind of wordy. It's a pretty intimidating question, actually. Which of the following is true about the values of 3 to the x and 3 to the x plus 2 for x greater than 0? And if you try to solve this problem algebraically, substituting numbers, um, it certainly can be done, but it's it just gets a little much. I mean, it's it's hard to understand what's ask, happening in the question. One of the things, um, Tom, I, I do with the mathletes at our school. We do some math competitions, so I'm one of the one of the sponsors. And um, on a really tough question, I always tell my students, graph it if you can. If you can graph it, go for it. Um, and so, uh, like on this question, I think it's just to me, it makes it easier to graph it. So um, I'm going to go ahead and try to to graph this. Uh, so I'm going to type in 3 to the x, 3 to the x plus 2, and I'm going to graph this. Uh, I, I usually hit zoom 6 just to get a standard viewing window. And mm -hmm. I really want to just focus in a little bit more. I don't know if you all have ever seen the zoom uh, box command. I'm just going to box that. So the first choice in the zoom menu on 84 is zoom box. And you do have to kind of use this cursor a little bit, um, kind of curse over to the top left-hand portion of the box that you want. I'm going to go all the way up to the top and press enter. And then I'm going to kind of cursor down here and it starts forming a box. And I want to kind of include all that information, maybe just maybe that much information, just kind of resize my screen. So when I press enter, it will resize my screen really nicely. I can see this yeah. function pretty well now. Um, and so uh, you can see, let's see the red graph. Um, uh, if you trace here, you can actually like see of oh, the blue graph was three to the X and the red graph was three X plus two. So now if I look at these questions, I think they'll just make more sense. So if it says what well, X is greater than zero. So that's this part of the graph is three to the X less than three X plus two for all time. Well, there's a problem. They kind of switch places uh, for a while. Three to the X is less, but then it looks like 3x plus 2 is. So I think these first two answers are, are gone. Uh, but then it talks about a constant C, and it looks like there's a, there's a point of intersection there. Um, we can find that point. Um, sometimes on 84, I hit second trace, uh, 5, enter, enter. In this case, you might want to move your cursor closer to the one on the right, because that's one I'm interested in. But there's a point there. Um, if you wanted to know what it is, it's 1.8. You don't have to know, but that would be the C value they're talking about. And it says 3x is less than 3x plus 2. But if x is bigger than c, then 3x is greater than 3x plus 2. So c uh, looks to be the right answer there. And it just, it's a lot easier to see and just understand that question when you see the graph of it. What do you, what do you think, Tom? Do you agree with that? Well, first of all, I forgot all about the Zoom box. So thank you for reminding me about Zoom box. I forgot about that. That's really nice because you can, yeah. you don't have to worry about playing around with where is X begin and Y begins. So you can wrap box around. So I like that. But no, I, I think it's really important to be able to talk up, to be able to see this. Because like you said, algebraically, I don't know how you do this algebraically. Um, I mean, you can plug in some numbers, but then you got to plug in more numbers. It's just a, it's a lot of is, work. Do you, know, do you remember if this is a, is this a calculator problem? Do you remember? It was a calculator question, yeah. Okay, gotcha. Um, and so then on 84, um, if you want to try 84 here, so um, I'm going to graph uh, the first function, uh, or the, I guess this yeah. is Inspire, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. And then graph the second function. And a, a nice new feature on Inspire, I don't know if you know this, but if you hit, if you put your cursor in the open space and then hit Control Center click there, you can grab the screen. It's my favorite icon, that little hand grab, and you can kind of move it down to somewhere where you like it. Um, and that's just another way to kind of adjust your screen. And you can see the same kind of thing that you can see. Um, of course, again, you might want to adjust kind of like Tom did, you know, double click that until you have a really nice view of the graph. But you can move this around. 
and again, answer the same kind of question on your Inspire uh, doing it that way. Yeah. Um, let's look at the next question. So this one's interesting in that, um, I mean, when you see uh, a system of equations, uh, typically substitution or elimination, and I would want my students to do substitution or elimination. In fact, it seems to be set up, well, you can go both ways, actually. You could kind of move it around and do elimination. You could definitely just substitute for Y there and do, um, so you really could do this a couple of different ways. Um, the math of that, um, I think this is using uh, substitution here. If you substitute and then solve, uh, factor the quadratic and you find x is 4, um, and so x, it, when x is 4, y is 0, and then you multiply x times y and you get uh, 0. So it certainly can be done algebraically, and I would want my students to do that. One of the things, Tom, you keep talking about how, <laughs> it's funny how you said your participants uh, got sick of you saying, think graphically, do this graphically. So one of the things I do with my students um, to push them that way, because I think a lot of students don't think graphically naturally, they just especially my good students, they tend to kind of like math teachers, they're good at algebra, so they crunch it algebraically. They can, they can solve anything algebraically, and sometimes it's not the best way. So I like to have them have a backup plan or think, well, maybe I could solve it this way. So even on a problem like this, I'll sometimes go, hey, could you solve this graphically? And I know without a calculator, that would actually be uh, tough to do. Uh, but I'll, I'll challenge them. Hey, can you just sketch this graph? I want them by hand to be able to sketch just about any graph, at least, a, you know, maybe find the intercepts, just real rough sketch of this. Um, and if you do that, if you kind of find the, um, so if you get your, yeah, I guess I'm doing this by hand. Let me get my pen here just a second. Um, and so on, on the linear graph here, it looks like it has a y-intercept of 16, so 0 comma 16 and an x-intercept of 4, so it crosses at, at 4 comma 0, and that line looks roughly like that. Mm -hmm. And then the quadratic graph, when you find the zeros, it has a 0 here and here, and I, I'm not sure exactly how far that goes up. It, it, it's opening down, I know that much, uh, but it definitely crosses also at 4 comma 0, so it crosses at the same point. So. I thought it was interesting, this one you actually could solve algebraic or graphically by hand because mm -hmm. the solution happened to be um, an intercept. Again, I know that it was just chance on this one, but I try to push my students to think graphically, whether that be on the calculator or even by hand. Um, do you ever do that with students, Tom? Um, I, obviously, you do with your participants. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, I really like this because very rarely do you have a linear quadratic system that has one point of intersection, that tangent point. And also yeah. as an intercept. So now this is this is a really good visualization problem. And and one final note about one thing about Inspire. If you don't have the cast version, you just have CX. If you do the solve linear systems algebraically, so if you're on a calculator page, and let's see what happens if I go to this. I just want to mention this. Uh, three, it says solve ooh, solve linear systems. So using the algebraic command on Inspire, it'll only solve a linear system. It will not solve um, this nonlinear system. It will on the CAS machine, though. Okay. Um, so that's just something I thought I would mention in case you're interested in, in that. A lot of times so people ask, what's the difference? The Can you go back to the question yeah. real quick? Because what is the answer to the question then? Okay, good, good point. So the question actually was, which of the following is the possible value for X times Y. So four zero is the, um, you know, the point um, for X and Y, but for, at four times zero is zero. So the actual answer is B, zero. Yeah, and this is another one where they get X equals four and jump on that again, huh? Boy, they love to, to, to get you to fall for that halfway answer, don't they? I mean, that's a, that's a consistent theme uh, we see through this, through this test. Um, Tom, when I saw this question, uh, it was a little baffling for me. Um, I actually first thought maybe I'd divide by C plus four here and get X equals and maybe set it equals zero. I was I was unclear on what to do. Did you have a sim similar kind of angst on this question? Not only yet yeah, did I, I I did I used this like probably what you're going to do is like a slider or something to figure it out. Once I saw it graphically, I felt stupid that I should have I should have known I should have known. But yes, I I did because I'd never seen a problem like that before. You know, oh yeah. Just, solve the equation. They don't usually say what value of C and, and have two C's on both sides, you know. 
That would right. Be so you said use a slider. Let me um, let me kind of uh, do this and see see what happens here. So I'm going to do a relation. So I just hit delete on the equal sign, and you get a relation. And I'm going to type in uh, C plus four times X equals eight minus C. So um, I believe on Inspire, when you type it in, it just says create a slider. And so you can say, okay. Um, and kind of like you, I really do like um, kind of setting it, minimizing the slider. So I, I like that. And it says we want no solutions. Well, Boy, it's hard to see what's happening, isn't it? Yeah. Um, Can we make that a lot bigger? Maybe that would help. Uh, I might even have to change the settings. Yeah, I think you might have to go to like 10 or negative 10. In this you know what might, would be better to have um, it might be better to have two separate equations. What do you think? Oh, yeah, right. Yeah. Let, yeah, me, that, let yeah. me try it that way. So I tried it that way at first. I'm going to go do a new. So I don't want that problem. That 1.5, the calculator already has a defined value for C. So I'm going to hit okay. the dock key and insert a new problem. So when you go to a new problem, now all my variables are fresh. In fact, it's F1. I've got no more C. I'm going to graph the left-hand side. So C. Uh, plus four times X. That first one did not turn out like I thought it was going to. Yeah. And I'm going to create a slider. And then the next one, eight minus C. And what is that graph? I guess it did. Yeah, eight minus C. Um, so I might need to change the uh, the view here. Maybe it's go 25. Okay. Okay, sure. this is kind of neat. So now I see these two lines, and I want no solution. It looks like they have a solution now. Ooh, there you go. So the answer is negative five. Is that the answer? Um, I think it's negative. That's the value for C. Is that what they asked for? That's always the question. Is C yeah, the constant? Good. What is the value for C? Yeah, I think it's negative four. Oh, let's see. Oh, negative four. C is negative four. I see that. Yeah, C is negative four right there. Yeah, and you can see um, that the two lines are parallel. Yeah. So how how did you solve this algebraically, Tom? Did you solve this algebraically? What did you do? So once I got C was negative four, I realized if you're solving an equation that has no solution, what happens to the coefficient of x? It goes to zero because the, the x basically disappear, you, you end up with something like two equals negative five or one equals seven. So here, for that to not have a solution, C plus four had to be equal to zero because there were no x. So you knew that C plus four has to be zero. Yeah, but well, I mean, I wonder how many of our students would even think to do that. No, and it wasn't obvious to me until I did it graphically and played around like you did with the sliders. Uh, and now, now and, once I saw it, it was like, oh, geez, I should have known that. You know, I should have known, and, you know. Right. And by the way, that, this would, yeah. that C on the other side doesn't matter. That, that, that's, it's a, a red herring. It's a, you know, it doesn't matter what that is. It doesn't make any difference. Oh, you're kidding me. Mm -hmm. That doesn't really matter? No. Oh, wow. I didn't, I've never thought about that. He's negative four. Wow. Um, yeah, I thought that was, and this is what this test does. The other thing I wanted to mention, this is uh, not a multiple choice question. And some of you may not have realized that, but at the end of every SAT calculator or no calculator test, test they have, uh, you know, depending on what type of test, four to eight grid in responses, they're called. And so it would have been a lot easier if this question had one of the answer choices of negative five, and I could just substitute that in. So this is just another layer of difficulty. I should point out, we, I created this problem as based on another one, and the answer is C equals negative four. On a grid-in question, that would not be the case. The, um, the grid-ins oh, are never accurate. Remember that? That's a good They're point. Between zero and nine, 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 nine. They can be fractions, that's, they can be decimals, 
but they cannot be negative numbers. So, so one, yeah. one thing to make sure your students know that. Yes, an SAT might not hire you to create problems if you create some that they can't bubble in the yeah, answer. They, they did at one point. I don't do that anymore. That was <laughs> oh, nice, nice. Um, so this one, um, sometimes they have these real-world problems. If you've seen those, this one has, happens to be about a, a space shuttle. They give you the equation, of course, and this is kind of interesting. They give you, it uh, looks like a restriction for T. So yeah. from zero to 100, this, uh, this space shuttle seems to have some kind of linear it's losing uh, fuel and, and so forth and a, at a linear pace as it takes off the first 100 seconds. Um, according to the model, what is the predicted mass of the spacecraft 40 seconds after launch? And so um, algebraically, 40 seconds, that's time. You can just substitute that in. It's, in, it's within the range, and certainly that will work. Uh, but they usually have another question as well, like in this case, they have a, a, a question 12 also follows the same information, and that one's a graph. The kind of neat thing here is when you see you have to graph it, you could, if you wanted to, kill two birds with one stone and just graph it the first time here. Um, so, so like on this one, if you have an 84, you could uh, go to Y equals. I'm going to clear out um, what we have. That'd be 2305 uh, minus... 9.75, and of course, when you're graphing, you have to use X. Um, and I'm going to go to my window, and I know the the Y max needs to be bigger than that, maybe uh, 2,500. But the X minimum, we can put a zero in there, and uh, 100 if we want, um, because that's the domain. And then the uh, Y max it needs to be very big, so. I'm just going to go 2,500 here. And just look at the graph. And so we see what the graph looks like. And again, one of my favorite features, even on, we, we showed this on Inspire, but I wanted you to see when you're in trace mode, you can type in a value. So you can type in, if I hit trace and hit 40 and press enter, I love the fact that it shows me graphically where it is and shows me the value right here. So that would be 1915 uh, would be uh, what it is. And then, of course, the next question is pretty easy when you look at the graph. So hold hold, I mean, up, hold you, up just for a minute. So this, yeah. these two questions have the same, go with the same paragraph? Does that happen often? The same paragraph. So, yeah, so every happen? test there's going to be uh, two, usually two, two sets of uh, questions where there's uh, two questions about one graph or chart or table or, or equation or paragraph. Okay. Uh, so, gotcha. so that's pretty common that you see. Um, and you can see pretty quickly, um, of course, I want students to be able to eliminate, you know, answers. So 2305, and just, you know, they did just enough. Do you notice how they put 2305 at the first term instead of like, maybe students are used to seeing the y-intercept or, the, you know, kind of their, the y, mx plus b. Um, this is kind of uh, the way a stat or a science teacher may do it and starts with the initial value there, 2305. And so it might be this a or it might be uh, d, but it's definitely d because the slope is, the rate of change is negative. Um, and so, and you can see very quickly with the graph, that's that's gonna be what it is. And again, if you wanna test a value, trace and zero, you can quickly see that y-intercept. Um, you can t t type in 100 and, and see the uh, y-intercept. One thing in 84, which is different than Inspire, is if I type a value that's outside of the window, if I typed in 110 and press enter, it's gonna say an error message. Uh, right. Because it has to be in the viewing window in order for that trace feature to work where you're substituting a value in. Inspire, you can type in any value pretty much and it, it'll work. Yeah. And again, um, so that, that last one you did is pretty much that thinking graphically again, knowing the yeah. slopes, slopes down, the y intercept, you know. Right. Um, and I don't know if we have time. We might have time for one quick one here. I think we're really close to end of time here. Uh, but we've got a lot. Of, we we actually got more accomplished than we thought, Tom. Don't you think? Yeah, and and we came out with the idea of less is more, fewer problems, and maybe more stuff in them. So we hope that yeah. it was okay with you guys. And so in this kind of question here, you can see that um, it's kind of like a scatter plot of the parabola. They don't show the full line there, but you get a, a real good sense of um, what's happening there. 
Um, I love for them to, to be able to eliminate bad answers. I think it's such a powerful strategy. So when they see that this has a maximum, they should know that that A value is uh, negative. And so uh, you can cross out, you know, these two are probably gone. Maybe they see a Y intercept that's eight. And so they know it must be one of those two. Um, these two are gone. And so pretty quickly you can see that the answer is Y. But think about our students, like some of them, uh, some of my students don't don't know uh, standard form quite as well. I think that's really what the SAT is testing here. Can students kind of, maybe they're good at vertex form, we do a lot of that, but do they know in standard form? Um, Tom, what do you think about that activity we do in our, when we do our SAT workshop? Um, I know one of my favorite activities is the three forms of a quadratic. Do you agree with that? Yeah, um, I know you were just in El Paso yesterday doing SAT. I was doing some in Detroit, and um, that was one of the things I did right away was that one because we don't spend enough time looking at those three different forms and seeing how they're different and how they're similar. So like you yeah. said, this is standard, then there's the, the, the vertex, but then also the factored form is a big deal. Right. You, know, you can see right. intercepts from that. So, yeah, good point. I give you a test. So, I mean, give you a pez. <laughs> nice, nice. A virtual pez. That's, that's nice. Yeah. Um, well, Michael, um, I think we are at a stopping point here. And um, I'd love to see who gets to win that, uh, that prize to the conference. Thanks so much, Jeff and Tom. So, Jeff, I'm going to take things back, if that's okay. Yep. Thanks. As we begin to wrap things up tonight, uh, if you have any last minute questions for Jeff or Tom, uh, please try to get those asked. I know they'll do their best to get those questions answered. So as Jeff just mentioned, uh, tonight we're giving away to one lucky winner, a uh, T-Cube International Conference registration. The T-Cube International Conference is coming up in Dallas in uh, mid-March. Uh, it's a great way to connect with fellow educators like Jeff and Tom uh, and to get excited about learning about pedagogy or content or technology. Uh, or any mix of that. Um, so please visit our website to learn a little more about the International Conference. And uh, tonight's lucky winner is Marisol Amido. So congratulations, we'll be in touch over email in the next couple of days to give you a little more information, but we hope to see Marisol as well as everyone else at the T-Cubed International Conference. Michael, one last question. Um, the bit.ly, uh, one participant wants to know um, if it's going to be emailed to everybody that so will have sort all of, materials. Yeah, it's going to be included in the documents I'm giving out here in a minute. Um, but okay. again, there's not uh, – my stuff will be there, but I don't think anyone cares about my stuff. They want your stuff. So uh, your stuff <laughs> will be included uh, in that bit.ly, uh, I think you guys said, by noon tomorrow. Great. Yeah. So when you leave the webinar tonight, uh, a brief survey automatically appears in your browser. Your feedback guides us as we plan future online events, and we really hope you share your thoughts in the post-webinar survey. So we may have had some uh, comments uh, that may not have been, been answered tonight for, uh, for one reason or another. Feel free to reach out to us on social media uh, and continue that conversation. We'd love to hear from you. To receive a certificate of attendance, go ahead and click the link that is in the chat window. Again, also there's a link uh, that I'm sharing tonight for the documents tonight. That's really just my documents, uh, but also included will be uh, the link that Tom and Jeff put together, the, the bit.ly. Um, so if you miss that for any reason, uh, hang tight. You're automatically get a follow-up email in a couple of days, and uh, but in a couple of days, those all those documents are going to be there. So. Uh, feel free to, to hang tight, wait for that email. You'll automatically get a link for the certificate, the documents, and the recording as well. And if you're watching this on demand, go and copy that link into your favorite browser to receive your certificate. Thanks so much, Jeff and Tom, for everything you shared tonight. We really appreciate it. It was fun. Thanks, thanks for having us. And thanks, everyone, for joining us. We hope to see you back online real soon. Have a great night.